So the problem of knowledge, this is possibly the most central question in all of philosophy. Certainly, I would say it's the central question for bourgeois and contemporary philosophy. Now, how it is that we form knowledge and whether or not that knowledge is objectively true is, of course, a very important theoretical question. It has to be said that philosophy has gotten stuck on this question. It's in a rut and it doesn't know how to answer the problem of knowledge. That is how it is that we have knowledge. A huge proportion of contemporary bourgeois philosophers are known are what is known as sceptics or, or even subjective idealists. Scepticism is the position of doubting knowledge and subjective idealism is a sort of extreme variant of that that says that all objective knowledge is impossible. So for, for the best part of maybe even 200 years, the most trends of bourgeois philosophy have essentially concluded that there is no objective knowledge. Now, in the early days of, of the bourgeois revolution and also the scientific revolution that went with it, uh, the bourgeoisie produced philosophical geniuses, the likes of Bruno, um, Bacon, Spinoza, Locke, Diderot. They were not subjective idealists, but they did utilise scepticism in order to question all of the received truths and dogma of, of, of religion, which was, a huge, which was a revolutionary thing. They were searching for a firm foundation for knowledge, a scientific foundation for, for knowledge. And they wouldn't accept any uh, appeals to God or to the nature of the soul as an answer as to why we have the ideas that we have. And, uh, you know, the main trend at that time was... was um, was optimism, a, a sort of materialist optimism, a belief in the progress and that humanity would better itself uh, by means of science. And the main, the main idea they tended to have was that genuine knowledge comes from experience. It doesn't come from the soul or from anything that God has given us, but it comes from experience of the world around us. However, following this initial revolutionary heroic period for the bourgeoisie, bourgeois philosophy kind of went into decline and, and it tended to become more conservative. So the, the major philosophers of the subsequent period, that is people like Hume, Berkeley, and especially, or well, most famously, Kant, they based themselves on the previous philosophers, but they drew different conclusions. Essentially, they concluded that we can't really know anything objective about the world. We can't know what the world is. We can never escape from our own senses and our own minds. Now, it's a strange paradox that in this, in that epoch, the epoch of unparalleled scientific advance, that the main ideas of the philosophers were, were that knowledge is impossible. Now, as I said, to some extent, that reflected, that was a positive thing. It reflected the need to question the received dogmas of religion. But um, it has to be said, it also reflected the limitations and the conservatism of the bourgeoisie as a class. And today, this rut of subjective idealism has become a complete chasm from which stagnant bourgeois philosophy cannot escape. Gone is the optimism in human progress and, and the use of science and reason to improve our lives. And philosopher after philosopher just choose over the cud of subjective idealism over and over again. 20th century philosophy was completely dominated by subjective idealism. At its beginning, we had the logical positivists, the pragmatists, the imperio critics. Later on, we had the phenomenologists and existentialists, and of course, the postmodernists. All of them, in one way or another, deny the possibility of objective truth or knowledge of an independent material world. And they just keep on churning this stuff out. Each time they, they re reveal it as if this is a, a great new insight, a completely radical new idea. For example, one of the latest ones, Donald Hoffman, who's got a celebrated book out, his book is called The Case Against Reality. And he says in it, and I quote, the universe itself is a massive social network of conscious agents that experience, decide, and act. If so, consciousness does not arise from matter. Instead, matter and space-time arise from consciousness as a perceptual interface. And I've already mentioned this paradox, but it's worth considering why it is that in this period of 
unparalleled scientific understanding, the dominant philosophy is that there is no knowledge. It's because despite the scientific advances that we have, those advances have no coherent direction to them. In many cases, science is simply used even to destroy the environment or to create ever more powerful killing machines. And even where that isn't the case, even where science gives us something useful, it isn't used to do that, it's used to generate profits. The point is that under the domination of the bourgeoisie, science is merely a tool for selfish gain, which means that they're not interested in a genuine all-round understanding of reality. They're not, you know, they're not interested in understanding. They, they, the, the, the typical mentality of, of the bourgeoisie is simply to, to use things that work and don't, you don't really need to understand why they work. This is reflected very clearly in the methods of most bourgeois philosophy, which always starts out from the atomized individual ripped from their social context. And what they do is they sort of examine this abstract thought that no real person actually has. And they attempt to answer all of the philosophical questions relating to thoughts on that basis. It's a bit like if a biologist attempted to explain how an animal lives by finding a dead, the dead body of that animal and examining it under the microscope. Instead of examining it in its real life, in the, in the real envir environment that it actually lives in. And the logical basis for this is, of course, formal logic. Formal logic is a, a set of rules in philosophy which basically teaches, encourages us at the very least, uh, to to put things into fixed categories, to sort of freeze them, to not look at them in their motion and to ask where they've come from and what they depend upon, but instead to sort of just box them up into so many lifeless categories. And this logic applied to the problem of knowledge lead, it, well, it makes, it makes a, a resolution of the problem of knowledge impossible. The philosophers take something that they call subject and they counterpose it to object. Of course, object means the entirety of the material world. And subject means either the individual think, thought, thinker or thought in general. But they start out from this fundamental compartmentalization. You know, the subject, thought, is treated as if it's a self-contained, self-sufficient thing that it just exists because that's the way that it is. It just happens to exist in that way. And the two sides are rigidly opposed in this way. As if the mind is, is, is a, a magical thing, a soul really, which sort of comes into being and then observes somehow the material world, which is always treated as a fundamentally different thing, a different substance entirely. And treating it in that way, of course, makes it completely impossible to understand how the mind, this totally unmaterial thing, can ever have genuine knowledge of something that is completely and utterly alien from itself. So to escape this rut, we need to escape the bourgeois worldview. We must abandon the starting point of this abstract, timeless, classless individual and instead study consciousness just like other scientists discuss, uh, study other natural phenomena. In other words, study it historically and in its real life, asking where does it come from, what is consciousness used for, um, and what are its limits on that basis? And Marx summed up the need to do this brilliantly in his famous thesis on Feuerbach. He said the following, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory, but is a practical question. Man must prove the truth, i.e. the reality and power the this-sidedness of his thinking in practice. The dispute over the reality or non-reality of thinking that is isolated from practice is a purely scholastic question. This is a brilliant insight because Marx is essentially saying we're asking the wrong question or we're posing the question in completely the wrong way and there is no solution to the problem in that scholastic manner. What Marx understood brilliantly is that thought is not disembodied. Of course if it were it would be absolutely incomprehensible. Why would you think this or that? If your thought is based on some sort of um, timeless soul or some, some other spiritual substance, what would determine your, your desires, your passions, your emotions? What would motivate you to, to acquire this or that type of knowledge and apply it? 
The only way to answer that theoretically is to understand the real material basis for thought, which is to say that all actual beings that think, in other words, all real people, are themselves material. They are objective beings. They are part of the natural world. That brings me on to the question of senses, which is a very important question for knowledge. The, the early empiricists of, of the bourgeois revolution were correct to say that knowledge is derived from sense experience. Instead of coming from the soul or from some other inherent property of human reason, but their mistake, their limitation was in seeing this experience purely on the level of the isolated individual. And in fact, lodged or, or implied in their theories was still the assumption that the thinking being is not a material being. We may gain knowledge via our senses of, of the material world, but, but the thing that actually gains that knowledge is not actually of the material world. Hence the fact that with Hume, for example, and with Berkeley, the senses that give us our, our, our knowledge were seen actually as a barrier to genuine knowledge of the external world. Because they said, actually, we're entirely dependent on what our senses give us. And of course, our senses are not of the material world, they're of the mind. But dialectically, the, the senses uh, are not a, a, a barrier between us and the external world, nor are they a bridge between a purely subjective world and an external objective world. Instead, the senses are a bridge between two different parts of the same world. And our senses themselves are a physical, material thing. Now, it's important to stress that we are part of the material world, but we shouldn't abolish the difference between ourselves and the material world. Some philosophers have attempted to say that we do have um, objective knowledge. For example, the German philosopher Fichte. He said that knowledge is, is, is possible, but and that and, and that the, the objective world is not fundamentally different from us, which might sound like uh, the correct position. But what he meant is that we are identical with the external world, because in fact, there is no external world. Everything is just a projection of the ego, of the, sub, the thinking subject. So for him, of course, we do have knowledge of these things because they're actually just forms of ourselves, which is just a verbal trick and it doesn't resolve the problem of knowledge at all. The thinking subject is not identical with the objective world. The objective material world is independent of the thinking subject. It, is, it existed before us and is the basis for our existence. But since we are ourselves part of nature, since we are natural beings participating in nature in order to survive, then of course, knowledge of the rest of nature is definitely possible. Probably the most famous an influential argument of subjective idealism comes from Kant. And he pointed out, and he was correct in pointing this out, that yes, our knowledge comes via our senses, but knowledge is itself ultimately impossible without utilizing certain abstract structures of the mind. The mind applies universal categories like cause and effect, time, big and small, you know, etc. It applies those categories, those abstract categories to sensory experience in order to make sense of it, to sort of filter it and give it meaning. But he point, he said, and, and this is where we disagree fundamentally, he said that these, these categories are simply properties of the mind, inherent properties of the mind. And therefore they make knowledge of, as he put it, the thing in itself, i.e. the material thing, outside of consciousness, independent of consciousness. These categories that we apply to experience make knowledge of that thing as it truly is absolutely impossible because we can never escape these categories. We can never think or experience without using them. And as I said, he sees these as inherent in the mind in each sort of individual taken separately. You know, every individual is born with these, these properties of the mind. And that's because he, he starts, like all these philosophers, he starts out from the abstract individual, the sort of timeless, classless individual of his imagination. And therefore, if, if consciousness, if, if this abstract consciousness must have these categories within, within it, then it must be a fundamental inherent feature of everybody's consciousness taken separately. Now, Kant does highlight a very important point in this. It's true that 
experience only becomes knowledge when we universalize it, essentially. So at the moment, I'm looking out of the window and I can see, what can I see? The only way I can explain and understand what I can see is by giving it a universal category. In other words, I'm looking at trees and those trees are green. Of course, each one of those trees is different, uh, uh, not just they belong to different species, but each one of them is a slightly different member of that species. But I still call them trees and I still call them green. Now, imagine if I didn't do that, if I didn't make use of any universal categories such as tree, green or anything, anything like that. Obviously, it'd be impossible for me to communicate to anybody what I was looking at. And actually, I myself wouldn't even be able to understand what I was looking at, what its significance was, unless I used categories like tree. But as Hegel quite brilliantly pointed out in criticising Kant on this, what this shows is that the so-called thing in itself, shorn of these abstract categories such as green, is uh, simply nothing. In fact, rather than being the way things really are outside of consciousness, this thing in itself is actually just a figment of the imagination. There is no such thing without these properties, without these general properties. He points out that if you strip away these universal categories, are, do you get to something that is more unique, more truly what that thing is? Or do you just get to an even more abstract thing? In fact, he makes the point that it, it becomes more abstract the more you remove these universal properties. All you could say about it is that it's a thing. In fact, that's exactly the term that Kant used, the thing in itself. And of course, everything is a thing. So by removing these abstract general properties, we don't get to a more unique, truer depiction of something. We actually lose what makes it what it really is. So yes, it's true. Knowledge is a synthesis. It is a dialectical contradiction of two opposites, the individual thing and the universal category that it is part of. But the mistake of Kant and of many other philosophers is to assume that these universal categories, these ideas such as greenness, the mistake is to assume that these are, com are just convenient fictions of the mind, that they're just sort of ways that the mind sorts itself out that have nothing to do with the way that things truly are. You know, they, people like that, they, it's quite a common thing to say, you know, that um, there's no such thing as, you know, if people don't like it if they get categorized, if you say that they are, they belong to a particular class, they, they want to be more unique than that, you know. Of course, it's true, there is no such thing as time, or of fruit, or of trees as such, there's only individual trees. We cannot find time or fruit as such or, or the tree. We can't look at it and say, oh, that there it is. It really exists. And so these people say these are actually these are just ideas. They don't really exist. Although, of course, as always with idealism, the problem with this is, is that it, it, it cannot explain the, 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 the basis or the origin of these ideas. If each mind, if each per thinking person is born inherently with these abstract concepts sort of lodged in their mind somehow, if they don't come from reality, if they don't really exist in the real physical world, then why on earth would we, as thinking beings, make use of these concepts and not others? What, what determines the concept of time? Why, why is that the concept that we have and not something else? Moreover, without being expressed in real physical objects, what actually distinguishes any of these abstract categories from one another? You know, how can we say that time or space are different from one another? And how can we define that difference without constantly applying it to real physical things that exist in time and space or are expressed in time and space? And um, of course, Marxists are often accused of, you know, of, uh, of applying the category of class to individuals and ignoring their individuality. And you do get people who are very insistent on their own individuality and then they're, they're not you know, to be categorized as this or that type. So is the category of working class, is that a sort of, uh, does that do violence to individuals? Do we, do we kind of, by applying it to individuals, do we lose something of what they truly are? But what is it, an in, what makes somebody an individual? Is the truest version of yourself, the version of you that is stripped of all influence from those around you? And how usually do people define their individuality? 
maybe they say, oh, I've got this this uh, really eclectic music taste. I, I'm really into these these bands that nobody else is. Or maybe they're petty bourgeois and they say, I'm I'm unique really because I've um, worked very hard. Uh, I set up this company and it's I do all the work and it's you know it's truly my own thing. But if you're into particular kinds of music, obviously that means you listen to music that other people have made. And of course, their ability to do so also depended on various economic and technological conditions. Similarly, the petty bourgeois business owner clearly depends on the development of the economy, the technology available, etc. And people to sell and buy from and to, they depend on all of that in order to have their business. And of course, above all, all of this, all of our, our ability to even think as individuals depends on the utilization of language and all of the knowledge that is contained in that, in that language. And therefore, obviously, if you strip away everything that isn't that individual, you are left with very, very little. So these universal categories, if you like, they they not only exist, but in a certain sense, they are the deepest truth about what exists. They do not exist as individual things, of course. There isn't an individual thing that is time or that is working class. But they exist, they, and they really do exist, in and through the real relations of all of the, the individuals, the, the, the real relations that the individuals actually stand in. So these universal categories, they don't exist somehow before or externally from the individual things. So of course we didn't have fruit as such, which somehow gave birth to apples and oranges and all other kinds of fruit. Yes, but at the same time, individual apples and oranges don't simply pop into existence out of thin air. So the meaning, for example, of this category fruit is that it expresses the history, the historical development of this kind of organic life. And the and you know the relations that it stand that they stand in you know apples and oranges for example they couldn't exist obviously without not just previous fruit but in fact the, the entire prior history of evolution and this brings me to what a, a genuine scientific dialectical knowledge is frequently think we think of the knowledge of something as being just a list of its features that is a kind of knowledge if you can call it that that is clearly based on formal logic. In other words, categorization, lifeless categorization. So to, to understand what apples and oranges or what human beings are, you just, you know, you, you notice the features that they tend to have in common, and then you just list them, which tells us absolutely nothing about why that thing exists and has those features. So dialectical knowledge of something is, is not like that. Instead, we, un we seek to understand the real history, the, the process behind the thing in question the internal contradictions that it have that drive it forwards, and also the, con the general context that that thing exists within, what it depends upon, what it is constrained by, etc. Whereas most philosophies have always tended to answer the, this question of saying, of, of universals by saying, well, it's either one or the other. In other words, the truth is either that all you have is individual objects, or others like Plato, for example, say that, no, 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 the real truth uh, is these these abstract perfect ideas of which you know all of the material objects you see are just poor copies whereas for marxists it is both both are necessary for us all real things that exist can only exist because they are part of a general system that produced them and that in turn will destroy them but similarly those general concepts those general systems or that, that they belong to cannot exist independently of the real individual objects that make them up. And the fact that our ideas are all about these universal categories, that they, that they constantly have to make use of these universal categories, this does not block us off from the way that things really are outside of these categories, because these universal categories are actually real. In other words, they express the real relations and the history between all of the parts that they, that they and, and the system to which they belong. But now we have to ask the question, how do we manage to get this knowledge? Now, as, he, as I mentioned, the, the, the empiricists of the, the beginning of the bourgeois revolution, they answered, we get knowledge, we get these ideas from individual experience. And at first glance, that appears to be a materialist thing to say, and indeed a correct thing to say. But in fact, um, the world, are, we do not cognize, we do not understand the world immediately through our senses. 
I mean, for example, a cat receives fundamentally the same sense information that we do. In fact, they, they receive probably largely better sense information because their eyes and their ears are, are generally better than ours. But clearly cats have far fewer ideas, far uh, worse an understanding of the nature of the world around them that they're seeing than we do. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with this optical illusion kind of experience you can have. You know, when you look at something and, and for a moment you have no conception of what it is that you're looking at. And there's a period where you, you just cannot sort of figure out what the parts of it add up to. Perhaps you're not even sure exactly where the thing uh, begins and where it ends. And then suddenly, for some reason, you realise what it kind of thing it is that you're looking at. And, and all the parts suddenly fall into place. It's quite a surreal experience when it does, does happen. And what this shows us is that, and, and by the way, a lot of the contemporary neuroscience um, is beginning to explain how this happens, how, how we really see things, basically. What this shows us is that conscious beings are constantly sifting uh, experience into categories. And this is a process which is heightened and, and, and sped up by, by uh, the ideas that we already have, which of course animals don't, don't have, have these ideas generally. In fact, that, those ideas that you have that you are always using to make sense of the world as you experience it, very few of those ideas have you generated from your own direct experience. The vast majority of it comes from the experience, the collective accumulated experience of society, which is given to us through language. And, you know, all of us are socialized uh, in society as we grow up. And we constantly make use uh, of this vast treasure trove of former experience, former ideas or, or existing ideas from society in order to navigate the world. That's one thing that the empiricists did not understand. The other thing that they did not understand was the active role of, 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 of humans in acquiring knowledge. The way they depicted us as uh, experiencing beings, if you like, not only did they depict us as sort of isolated individuals, but also as passive individuals just receiving sense data from the world. And from the experience of that, set, the passive experience of that sense data, we would each of us individually build up ideas about the world. But of course, if we were passive in that way, it's what would determine what it was that we learned from our experience? What would make this or that experience particularly significant and worthy of learning from? So, in, but in reality, of course, the process by which society gains these experiences which produce knowledge is through practical activity, which is performed in order to meet our objective needs, since we are, after all, natural beings that need to survive. And in turn, of course, it is this labour of millions of people that determines the form that society has. And therefore, in general, it determines what kind of experiences and needs humanity has, and therefore, ultimately, what kind of ideas that humanity has. And I think this can also help us to resolve one of the other classic problems of philosophy which is very similar to the problem we've discussed, been discussing about whether or not universals really exist. Philosophers such as most famously Plato pointed out that these universal ideas are always more perfect than the imperfect embodiments of them that we find in the material world. So for example, the idea of a circle is always is perfect, whereas any actual thing that we call a circle that we find is always never really a perfect circle it's always deficient in some small way and of course he concluded that uh, that therefore that these ideas are the are um that's 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 the true reality you know and that the, the material world is 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 a is not really true it's an imperfect reflection of of the higher reality the answer as to why these ideas appear to be perfect lies in the character of social labor which produces these ideas in other words the accumulated ex practical experience of thousands or even millions of people gradually reveals the sort of the essential features of something such as a circle and discards what is inessential or imperfect. Those who first started making wheels, of course, they needed to have a general concept of the wheel to communicate to their children or to other people that they knew. And that needed to get at what was essential about a wheel. 
So it is labor that creates the need for an idea, it produces the content of knowledge. And this knowledge has a, a sort of perfect or, or ideal form, if you like, precisely because it's the product of not just one individual, but the collaboration of many people over a long period of time. But of course, throughout history, philosophers have been members of the ruling class. And so they have they've neglected or had no understanding, no appreciation of this literally laborious process behind the formation of ideas. As I said, they take the thinking individual in, in an abstract form, completely removed from the, 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 the historical process that produced those ideas that that individual has. And so to these people, these powerful ideas that these individuals make use of seem almost magical because they cannot understand this, this hundreds of thousands of years of, of prehistory that allowed us to, to generate those ideas. And so obviously they concluded that uh, ideas don't come from, from experience. They, they are something better or removed from the, the, uh, the material world. And they treated consciousness and ideas not as a process, but as a finished thing. And finally, the last thing I want to discuss is how it is that we have false ideas and what that means. Because clearly many of our ideas turn out to be false. Many of humanity's ideas, that is. And so it's tempting to conclude, well, inevitably the ideas that we have today will turn out to be false, and therefore everything is false. But dialectics teaches us not to think in these irreconcilable absolutes, such as knowledge is either perfect or it is completely non-existent. Now, many philosophers are fond of pointing out that our senses deceive us, and certainly that is the case. Pretty much everybody has flawed senses. But the fact that we can determine that somebody has flawed senses and how and why they have flawed senses tells us everything about the process of knowledge. First of all, it obviously, uh, if we can show the cause of, of that person's flawed senses, then what does that mean? It means we're showing that their senses are material things and we can measure and understand uh, how they work. In other words, that we are physical material beings and our physical material form determines our ability to know things. But also the ability to show somebody else's error tells us a lot about how knowledge advances. In other words, our knowledge is, once again, it's not really about being a product of each individual taken separately, but the, but the product of society. I would say that everybody's sense experiences and everybody's ideas are inevitably, to some extent, flawed or imperfect. But then it is possible for other individuals to see through that and to correct those mistakes and thereby to collectively advance human knowledge. And of course, technology here is vital. I mean, in the case of measuring somebody's senses and finding out that they're flawed. Obviously, we use human technology in order to determine that. And of course, we can use technology to see things, for example, to see wavelengths of light that our own eyes are not capable of seeing. And that shows that there are no absolute barriers to knowledge, and there can be no absolute barriers to knowledge. Everything is part of the same material world and therefore must in some way influence and be influenced by other things in the material world. And therefore, obviously, we can come to know the effects of those things and ultimately come to understand them. Human knowledge is, of course, never perfect. It's never finished. And many of our existing ideas will be shown to be false. But we should also say that the flawed ideas of yesterday are not just complete rubbish. There is truth within them. And without those ideas, we couldn't have the knowledge we have today. Also, the fact that some of our ideas get shown, many of our ideas end up being disproven, doesn't mean that there's no objective truth. In fact, it means the opposite. You cannot disprove something without inadvertently proving something else and making use of objective reality to do so. And lastly, I would say that it's not really true that everything turns out to be false. That's an exaggeration. So we disproved that the earth is flat. It would be rather mechanical to assume that therefore we will eventually disprove that the earth is round, as if everything just equally gets disproven. Will it be disproven that um, evolution proceeds via natural selection? Of course, Darwin's ideas will be perfect and have been perfected and deepened, that's true. But the basic idea that he had is, is absolutely true, and I don't think that will ever be disproven. Similarly, Marxism will be, and has been deepened. And of course, individual Marxists make mistakes all the time. 
for the fundamental ideas of historical materialism, for example, the idea, the fact that the material world exists independently of us, that's not going to be disproven and it turned out to be the opposite. Anyway, to sum up, why, why are we having this discussion? Why does it matter to get our epistemological position correct? It's because the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of a socialist society is no mean feat. It's not something we can stumble into blindly with our heads full of prejudices and, and, and other errors. Socialism doesn't mean simply slightly improving the lives of the working class. It means abolishing all class society and all privileges. And it means humanity for the first time really understanding itself. And instead of being pushed and pulled along by this or that temporary pressure or narrow interest, it means a co consciously applying our scientific knowledge to, to solve the underlying problems of humanity. And of course, it, ex it, it is only possible thanks to the, advance the incredible advances of science and productive technique over the past few hundred years. And it stands to reason that those who want to hold society back must also make use of retrograde ideas. Those who want to protect and preserve narrow interests must make use of illusions, and prejudices and other kinds of short-sighted uh, ideas. And those who were revolutionaries but are in the process of abandoning revolution always retreat into subjective idealism because they've given up the cause of understanding the world in order to change it. And they have to say that there is barriers, that there are things we can't understand and things we can't do in order to justify their position. And yet, despite all of this, humanity advances from one discovery to another. We need, therefore, a philosophical method that accepts all of this and on the firm basis of human reason draws the optimistic conclusion that, yes, we can and we must change society. Marxism pulls aside the veil of mystery and shows us the real workings and the real history of humanity. We can and we do understand humanity. And on that basis, we can and we will use this knowledge to establish a rational society that is socialism. OK, thank you, Daniel. That was an excellent introduction to the topic. We really cut through the fog and confusion that you find in bourgeois philosophy today. We will now open things up for contributions. First up, we have Ben Curry from Britain. Hi, thank you very much, comrades, and uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to say a word or two about um, well, neuroscience. Um, but first, um, the empiricists who Daniel was talking about, they see the acquisition of knowledge as very much a one-way street. As Daniel explained to the empiricists, our senses are bombarded by the external world, and those sense, impression, those sense impressions, uh, they are the sole source of our knowledge. Uh, the, the, the English empiricist philosopher John Locke uh, likened our minds to a, a blank white sheet of paper, which for him is inscribed with thoughts and memories by the senses, in just the same way as a sheet of paper is inscribed by a pen. Now, Dan, Dan read out uh, Marx's second thesis on Feuerbach, um, in which Marx explains that the, uh, the question of the truth of our knowledge isn't just a question of observation, it's a practical question of testing the truth that this sidedness of our knowledge in practice. It's through labor, it's through changing the world that mankind has come to know the world. So how did our ancestors find out that some berries are edible and some are poisonous? Well, they, they ate them and some of them got quite sick, presumably. And they found out that fire is hot by sticking their hand in the fire. And uh, the working class comes to understand its own strength and its own interests through practice as well, through struggle. But for many decades, the, uh, the dominant ideas in neuroscience have been formed under the influence of empirical epistemology. And this has led to something of a, of a schema um, in which the brain is seen to operate something as, as follows. So our, our sensory neurons bring information into the brain from our sense organs, our eyes and ears. And presumably there's some special region then in the brain where these senses are, are processed like a central processing unit in a computer. Um, decisions are made there and then uh, signals are fired out and those signals are sent again in a one-way direction uh, to our, our limbs telling them to move. So sensory neurons bring information in one way, motor neurons take instructions out the other way, that's how it goes. But no one has yet found this central processing unit in the brain um, so far in, in neuroscience because that's simply not how the brain works. Um, and this has forced some neuroscientists to, to, to question this simplistic schema which describes in a very uh, mechanical way the, re uh, the relationship between brain, body, and environment. And their discoveries have, have uh, uncovered precisely how important practical activity is for the human brain to know the world. And scientists are discovering there's a dialectical relationship between sensation and practice. To take a simple example, 
how does the brain know that when we see a kaleidoscope of colors of blues and greens, that what we're actually seeing are the leaves of a tree against the blue sky? How is it possible to give the input of our sensory neurons meaning? How can we ground our sensations? And uh, this is the uh, subject of an interesting little article in the Scientific American that I read recently. It's got a very atrocious idealist title. It's called How the Brain Constructs the Outside World. But I'm glad I, I, I read past the title. It's, uh, it's by a Hungarian neuroscientist called uh, Georgi Buzaki. And in this article, he explains that the brain circuits are only able to ground incoming sensory information by taking some action. So uh, Buzaki uh, uses the example of how a stick appears to bend when, it's, when we see its reflection in water. But we know it's not, an actually a it's not actually a broken stick by moving it around. If you, if you hold a flower at arm's, at, at, at arm's length and behind it there is a tree that is 100 meters away and behind that a mountain that's 10 kilometers away, to pure sensation they appear to be the same size. But we take an action in refocusing our eyes on the flower in the foreground or reaching out and touching it and that tells us it's in the foreground. Whilst when we move to the left and right we see the tree moving against the background and that tells us that the tree is in the middle ground. But neuroscientists like Buzaki have made some very interesting discoveries that prove that it's not just sensory neurons involved in informing our brain. Our motor neurons, which are responsible for sending signals to take actions in some part of our body, have also been shown to send information back to our cerebral cortex in a loop, which they refer to as corollary discharge. And these, this, this corollary discharge helps inform the brain about the meaning of our senses. A simple example of how it works can be demonstrated with your vision. If you look at something a few meters away and dart your eyes to the left and to the right, that thing you're looking at doesn't appear to move. But if you look again at it and close one eye and then press against your eyeball while you're looking at that thing, the world does appear to move. And this is because when you move your eyeball voluntarily, a signal is sent back to your brain. And that tells you that the apparent motion of the image your brain receives isn't because the world is moving, it's because you're moving your eye. But when your eye moves unexpectedly, it appears that the world is moving. Voluntary action informs the brain, and it does it without you even having to be conscious of it. And conversely, the failure of our brain to correctly interpret this corollary discharge, this feedback from our motor neurons, is believed by some neuroscientists to be at the root of certain psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. When our brain is unable to tell whether movement in the world is, is caused by our actions or by objective processes, the, the, the result is quite naturally uh, quite distressing hallucinations. If, if the brain is unable to receive and, and, and correctly interpret information from the actions that we take, the practical activity that we, that we carry out, we're literally unable to comprehend the world around us. So in their own way, uh, these, these people are not Marxists, these neuroscientists. But they are independently saying what Marxists have said and what Marx said in the second thesis on Feuerbach. To know the world, more is necessary than simply to observe the world. In the words of Marx, we must prove the this-sidedness of our knowledge by taking some action. And for Marxists, of course, Marxism is not just a nice set of ideas, but it's indissolubly linked with action, with the revolutionary struggle to change society. We'll now proceed with some more contributions to the discussion. First up, we'll have Oliver Brotherton, Britain. So, Oliver, if you're ready, please go ahead. Hello, comrades. I wanted to speak on two trends in the theory of knowledge that arose in the 20th century, and which, although they seemed new and attractive, uh, repeated many of the mistakes of the historical examples that Daniel discussed. So the first of these trends is so-called pragmatism, which developed in the US at the start of the last century. Uh, the central goal of pragmatism was to emphasize the usefulness of knowledge above all else. It's only worth knowing something if it's useful to do so. In this way, the personal applications of truth are raised above their objective validity. And the central question here then is really what makes something useful? Pragmatism's only answer to this really was to, to venture into empiricism. Uh, usefulness and therefore truth isn't decided by what we can know about the objective world. It was decided by empirical and therefore subjective aspects of experience. Uh, C.S. Pierce, one of the founders of pragmatism, uh, he claimed that what we mean by truth is simply what everyone agrees to be true. Now, it might be very useful for everyone to agree on things, but it really says nothing about the way the world actually is. And we have to be clear about where these subjective statements of usefulness really come from. Ultimately, what's pragmatic for you is dictated by your class position. As Trotsky says, a virtue for one class can be a sin for another. Uh, the socialist revolution, for example, certainly wouldn't be very useful for the ruling class. And they certainly wouldn't all agree to it. 
but that says nothing about socialism's objective role in liberating the working class. If we want to have a genuinely scientific analysis, we cannot judge objective processes by subjective measures. But another fundamental aspect of empiricism is that it stops its analysis at the surface level. The way things appear to us doesn't tell us all there is to know about their internal process. We also have to analyze ours. All empiricism, but particularly pragmatism, takes so-called common sense as absolute law. And the shallowness of this analysis can lead to all kinds of errors. Without an understanding of logic to flesh out our analysis, all kinds of confused ideas can fill in the gap. Uh, William James, one of the founders of pragmatism, uh, he wrote a defense of the existence of God on the basis of his radical empiricism. And the key piece of evidence for this claim was that he interviewed people who had had religious experiences. And so unsurprisingly, these people were very enthusiastic about their experience. And this was enough for a pragmatist to defend belief in God. But empiricism is not the only route to subjectivism, dualism and confusion. Another key trend in 20th century philosophy was existentialism. And existentialism arrives at the flaws of pragmatism by the opposite route. Existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Simone de Beauvoir uh, they begin their philosophy by raising the subject out of their material circumstances. Sartre argued that the fundamental division in the world was between things that think and things that do not think, that is, between the subject and the object. And his fundamental argument, which is genuine, uh, generally shared by existentialists, is, the, is that the only thing that conditions consciousness is consciousness itself. Our beliefs are not reflections of our material situation. They are choices we make in response to it. And Sartre explicitly applies this to the question of class struggle. He says that no matter how bad the objective situation can get for the working class, these conditions cannot themselves bring about a revolutionary change. The desire for a revolution is something the worker arrives at independent of their situation, as if by magic. He says that the objective conditions of poverty are completely divorced from the experience of poverty as bad. So why do we think poverty is bad? The existentialist can only say that it's a choice. So this so-called radical freedom is a freedom from the material world, a fetishizing of the subject in general and of the individual in particular. But by stripping us of an understanding of how we relate to the world around us, existentialism makes us impotent to change anything. If I can determine my own consciousness, why not simply choose to enjoy pop? The anguish that the existentialists feel in response to our radical freedom is in fact a nausea at their own class position. Petty bourgeois academia can change nothing about the world. Cutting us off from the material world cannot serve to change it. What we need is to understand the world in order to change it. And ultimately, it is only the method of Marxism that is able to do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Oliver. That was brilliant. Uh, next up, we have Martin Kohler from Switzerland. Daniel and Ben already quoted Marx's second thesis on Feuerbach. And the thesis on Feuerbach is one of the most important texts of Marx's philosophy. All the general lines of Marxist philosophy can be found in a condensed form in this short document. And you could probably elaborate on each one of the 11 theses for hours. I'd like to make just a brief comment on the first one of the thesis. Marx states in the second thesis, in the first one, sorry, the chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism is that the thing, reality, senselessness, is conceived only in the form of, of the object or of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity, practice, not subjectively. Hence, in contradistinction to materialism, the active side was developed abstractly by idealism, which, of course, does not know real sensuous activity as such. What Marx implies here is that his dialectical materialism is something new that overcomes the limitations of all previous forms of materialism. Materialism before Marx was contemplative and passive. It looked at the objective world seemingly from the outside, without being an active part of it. It either had a mechanical one-sided conception, where the subject just passively receives the sense data from the objective world, as was the case in bourgeois materialism, or it just philosophized about the objective world without really asking what the relation between the objective world and the thinking and acting subject was as was the case in ancient Greek materialism. And as Marx explains here, it was idealism that developed the active, subjective side, the relation between man and nature in general, and of the theory of knowledge in particular. More specifically, it was German idealism from Kant to Hegel. And it is exactly by integrating this active, subjective side into his philosophy 
that Marx was able to overcome the one-sidedness and the limitations of earlier forms of materialism. In other words, in a seemingly paradoxical way, Marx was able to overcome the limitations of earlier materialism by directing a weapon against the weak side of materialism, which was developed by the enemy camp, by idealism. But there is a common misconception of this process in academic so-called Marxism, where we sometimes hear objections to our claim that Marxist philosophy is materialist and therefore fundamentally opposed to idealism. Objections like, but Marx doesn't just refute idealism. That's a mechanical way, view and too one-sided. They say things like Marxism integrates both materialism and idealism in a synthesis. And I, I sometimes hear this also from comrades. And to be honest, I also shared these confusions at my beginnings of becoming a Marxist. But this is a serious misconception of what Marx did and what Marxist philosophy is. Under the pretext of using dialectics, they try to fuse together idealism and materialism. But this has nothing to do with, with real dialectics. It's a typical petty bourgeois way of thinking, trying to compromise between two hostile antagonistic camps. For them, the fact that Marx overcame mechanical materialism with the help of dialectical idealism means that Marx's philosophy somehow stands in between or above the traditional opposition of idealism and materialism. And this is very dangerous. It leaves the door wide open for idealism to enter back in. And in this epoch, this epoch of capitalist decay, idealism is virtually everywhere. We need a rock solid understanding of materialism to be able to fight against all the pressures from non proletarian classes. Marx didn't adopt any idealism into his conception. Men and their minds are part of nature. But as Dan and also Ben explained very well, they're not just a passive object, passively subjected entirely to their environment. They are interacting with their environment. Through labor, they actively transform their environment. And it is precisely in this active process of interaction with their objective environment that men gain knowledge of this environment and the inner workings of nature, not through mere passive contemplation. We learn through our collective experience of manipulating our environment. We make experience, experiences how the objective material world reacts to our actions. And with the accumulation of these experiences and observations, we can generalize and draw con conclusions of the on the properties of matters and its inner relations. And these generalizations in turn are then tested again in practice. So this conception of the active and subjective side has nothing idealist about it. It's not just the activity of the mind as for the idealists. Instead, we have real material humans with flesh and blood who are part of nature and who really act upon nature in order to satisfy their needs. All ideas and knowledge comes out of that material process. And through this knowledge, mankind pro progressively gains the capacities to subject the objective world of, of nature to their own conscious control. And in this way, for the first time, consciousness and ideas are explained in a fully materialist way. So once again, there is not a single atom of idealism in Marxism. And we really have to get that right if we want to resist the pressures from alien classes to be able to fight for socialism. Okay, thank you, Martin. Another excellent contribution. Up next, we will have Adam Powell from Pakistan. Uh, we are living in a material world and our own self is made up of matter. But human body is capable of thinking and a whole thought process goes in the mind of humans. These thoughts are not matter and we cannot touch our thoughts or smell or hear thoughts of ours or of others. Some people say that thoughts are also matter, which is completely wrong. Uh, they try to explain the neurological workings of brain and chemical reactions going on up to a point where they try to prove that thoughts or thinking process is a material thing. It is true that uh, without a material body and neurological physical structure, brain is unable to produce thought. A dead person cannot think and uh, thought process ends with the end of life of a person but still thinking process is not matter. The whole history of philosophy spread over centuries has been a struggle to establish a relation, a relation between this thinking process or thoughts produced in a human mind and the material world around us. Idealist philosophers would say that better doesn't exist, while materialist philosophers before Marx would emphasize the role of sense experience and belittle or deny the role of mind. In this process, the philosophers have tried to discover the laws of this thinking process 
or the logic and also that what is the relation of thinking process with the objective world uh, in the marxist philosophy of dialectical materialism we find the solution to this riddle and the correct relation between the thinking process and the material world is established in fact marx arrived at this conclusion through the critique of hegel's philosophy hegel discovered the method of dialectics in which mediation between the subject or thinking mind and the objective world takes place hegel describes this whole process in great detail and how in the beginning there lies an immediacy or the moment when the process of mediation has yet to begin between the subject and the thing in itself according to hegel uh, and i quote the quote starts uh, the Im- immediate ex- existence of spirit consciousness nice. contains the two moments of knowing and the objectivity negative to knowing and in the same paragraph of phenomenology he continues uh, the science of this pathway is the science of the experience which consciousness goes through the substance and its movement are viewed as the object of consciousness hegel explains in detail this whole process of subject of appropriating the object at the end of this process the thing in itself mediating with the subjective mind becomes the thing for itself in his critique on hegel's philosophy marx understood the limitations of hegel due to his idealism he pointed out those problems to develop the dialectical method discovered by hegel from a materialist point of view for hegel the objective world exists only as thought entities or concepts marx said and i quote the quote starts the human character of nature and of the nature created by history man's products appears in the form that they are products of abstract mind and such therefore phases of mind thought entities for hegel subject is also called consciousness or self consciousness and the object is also called abstract consciousness and marx said the quote starts just as entities objects appear as thought entities so the subject is always consciousness or self consciousness or rather the object appears only as abstract consciousness man only as self consciousness quote ends hegel in the end of this uh, process of mediation leads to the identity of subject and object and thus shows that all the process of thinking or mediation for him was within the thinking mind and not between the thought and the material world outside of mind or in the words of marx uh, it was dialectic of pure thought another quote of marx uh, the quote starts just as in itself abstract consciousness the abstract consciousness uh, i would add is the form in which the object is conceived is uh, the quote continues is merely a moment of distinction of self consciousness what appears as the result of the movement is the identity of self consciousness with consciousness and he says that the movement of abstract thought no longer directed outward but proceeding now only within its own self that is to say that the dialectic of pure thought is the result thought and from marx's point of view the complex relation between the material reality and the concepts in mind doesn't take place only in thought but in reality the quote starts the question where objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory but is a practical question for marxists unlike hegel the complex phenomena like the state political parties and revolution doesn't exist only in thought but in reality and are part of the material world the state apparatus around us is undergoing tremendous changes under the hammer blow of events and so does the concepts about the state in the minds of people these concepts have been developed over time with the collective experiences of people and also through rational insights into these phenomena over time during a strike when the ruling class uses full force of state to break the strike of workers the concepts about the so called benevolent state undergo profound changes the concepts about various political parties have also been developed over a period of time these parties in a given society can undergo several changes in particular sub circumstances and so does the concepts in the minds about these parties though this relation is not directly proportional and the thought process might sometimes lag behind the actual event yes. but ultimately it is the material conditions that determine the consciousness and uh, as marx wrote in the uh, thesis on feuerbach that all social life is essentially practical all mysteries which lead theory to mysticism find their rational solution in human practice and in the comprehension of this practice and uh, i will end at the la- uh, last thesis of feuerbach the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways the point is to change it for bringing panel back in to sum up the discussion i'd like to alert comrades to a couple of books related to this topic first we have anti jeering by engels which has a fantastic section on philosophy and the theory of knowledge and secondly materialism and imperial criticism by lenin 
which is a brilliant demolition of subjective idealism. So get your copies at wellread-books.com. That said, I'll hand back to Daniel to sum up the discussion. Okay, well, I certainly won't have time to um, reply to everything that was said, of course. There's just two things uh, that were said that made that I have something I want to say on. Ben gave a lot of interesting examples of how science has shed light on how the mind is an active participant in it, in sensory and conscious experience. As uh, you know, I just dis- I, I discussed in the lead off, the mind applies abstractions, generalizations to experience to make sense of it, and it's doing that all the time. But it doesn't just do that with conscious ideas. There's also an ongoing process, an unconscious process underneath that of filtering information into in meaningful ways, which is a, a process that we share with many animals. For example, scientists understand now that the the, the mind is constantly, um, it's kind of filtering information out all the time and, and concentrating only on key information. The mind essentially has what you could call algorithms that allow it to predict what information it is going to receive or rather what is going to happen around it. So that it can, con- because otherwise we would be just overwhelmed with detail, with, with unnecessary detail. And it, it basically says, the mind basically says, it's obvious what all the rest of the information is. I don't need to process that. I can guess what what, what is there. This is the same principle behind um you know, compression on with um, digital with com- with computers, where files are compressed, in which unnecessary information, repetitious information, is filtered out, and an algorithm is is used to fill in the blanks. For example, if you look at a blue sky, obviously there's a lot of blue space, and and the mind doesn't really need to process all of that information for every tiny little, every tiny little blue bit of blue light that hits the retina. So the mind guesses essentially that the, the the sky continues to be blue, and this this process uh, is probably one of the main causes of hallucinations. For example, people who have lost their eyesight, they typically see things like all the time. They're constantly seeing things, even though they don't have any eyesight. But what they see is is obviously not real. It's you know for some reason they frequently see lots of small people, like small, strange people just kind of moving around in their vision. And if if such people are, are very stressed or worried, frequently the, the images they see are of, of like zombies and like dead bodies and things like this. It's, it's, very, it's actually very unpleasant for them, as you, can, as you can guess. And it's thought that what that is the result of is, is the mind, uh, that the same process that sort of predicts what, you know, fills in the, the, the blanks essentially of our experience. It's that when we no longer are receiving sense data, visual sense data from the external world, that same tendency becomes unmoored, essentially. It kind of goes off on its own tangent. And also, you know, if, if you take hallucinogenic drugs, um, it's thought that it's probably a similar thing that is happening. The, the patterns people see are as a product of the mind being overactive in its predictions essentially anyway this doesn't prove that uh you know that our experience is subjective because we're always you know we're predicting things and we're we're, we're imposing onto our experience our own um subjective uh ideas if you like actually what these hallucinations show is that we need constant input for real data from the external world otherwise what we see frequently becomes nonsense um also um Oliver mentioned pragmatism, the this, this, this school of, of philosophy known as pragmatism, which is an, another form of subjective idealism from the 20th century. And what it says is essentially that ideas have nothing to do with truth. Uh, they're not trying to, you know, our ideas, we might think we're trying to say something about the external world, but that's not really what ideas are about. All that ideas really say and all that they're capable of saying is this thing works and is useful and therefore that's why we have that idea but the i mean the the materialist answer to that is so obvious which is yes but what determines that something is useful and what determines that something else is not is not useful of course it is objective reality and our particular relation to it as objective material beings the other point i want to discusses the um 
the redundancy of subjective idealism. When people first learn that such a, a discipline, such a school of thought exists, they often find it absolutely laughable. And they often say to anybody who subscribes to that school of thought, well, why don't you just run out into the road then and wait to get run over since it's all just a figment of your imagination? And of course, no subjective idealist actually applies the ideas in that way. They live their lives just as if it weren't in any way true. They continue to eat food, they continue to, to look before they cross the road, etc. And they will say, you know, in response to that, well, this is like you're missing the point. The, the point of this philosophy, it's not a practical thing. It's it's just a it's just a sort of theoretical insight. Subscribing to it doesn't oblige you to make any changes about how you live your life, which is an admission really that it's uh, it's a, a kind of um but yeah, it's a redundant philosophy essentially, a dead end. And Hegel said the following about skeptics. If anyone actually desires to be a skeptic, he cannot be convinced any more than he who is paralyzed in his limbs can be made to stand. Skepticism is, in fact, such paralysis and incapacity for truth, which can only reach certainty of self. As Marx said, it is a scholastic question. It's not a practical or relevant question. However, I do think it is possible to disprove subjective idealism, even from within their own arguments. And the clue is in their own admission that their philosophy makes no practical difference to their lives. Some subjective idealists have, have ended up f finding that in order to explain what subjective experience is like, they need to make use of the, object the idea of an objective world, independent of our own minds. For example, Fichte, the German subjective idealist, in order to, because he said that everything is just your own ego and all, the world around you is, is a projection of your own ego. But then he had to explain why it is that this ego that creates reality for itself, why it is that this ego constantly surprises itself with the experiences that it has. In other words, each thinking person obviously does not feel as if they have complete and total control of the world around them and the world around them does things that they do not expect it to do there's obviously a fundamental aspect of of human experience that any philosophy should be able to explain Fichte's explanation of it is that the mind the ego divides itself and that there is a part of the ego which sort of presents experiences to the subjective ego or the inner ego, and therefore giving the appearance of, of not having control over our surroundings. The imperio critics that Lenin attacked, they did the same thing. For example, Bogdanov made a distinction in his theory between the sense experiences that are dependent upon the nervous system and the sense experiences that are not. In other words, everything is just sense experience. There's nothing beyond sense experience. But within sense experience, there's a difference between those sense experiences about oneself and those that are about the ap ap apparently external world. So basically, this is an admission that the, the, they, they need the category of, the, of objectivity in their own philosophical systems in order to make any sense of how things really seem to us. So what we have is a philosophy which adds, it adds and changes absolutely nothing about how we actually live our lives and it, the ideas that we use on a day-to-day -day level. And even within its own purely scholastic system, it reintroduces uh, the basic ideas of materialism in the sense of an independent objective world within its own system. But it just says, no, 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 but that's still part of subjective experience and it's dependent upon the subject. So basically it's a convoluted system tying itself in knots to end up explaining nothing and present to ourselves a picture of reality, which is just, it's just a confused way of telling us what we already know. But in the process of doing so, it, it estranges ourselves from, from our, rather than helping us to understand how we actually develop the ideas that we have, it, it estranges ourselves, ourselves from that process. It just presents all of our typical ideas about experience, but in, an, in a subjective idealist packaging, essentially. But what we need is a philosophy that does not estrange us from our own consciousness and the way that we live our lives, nor one that has a complete and fundamental chasm between the philosophy itself and the actual life that you are supposed to lead, or that you do lead, rather. We need to study, as I keep on saying, we need to study consciousness 
the way that it really is. And instead of just doubting the ability to know anything, we need to move beyond that and say, well, how is it that we do know things? Once again, if, if these ideas are so redundant and so ridiculous, why on earth do they exist? What role does this, this trend play? Well, first of all, I think it, it, unavoid, it is a, a faithful expression of the strange social position of the petty bourgeois academic, and in many ways, the outlook of the bourgeois class in general for whom the external world and society is, is really ultimately baffling. And they're impotent to do anything about it. And they're unable to connect their ideals about the world, how the world ought to be, and their practice and how the world actually is. Even the richest, the most powerful capitalist in the world is incapable of changing the laws of capitalism and preventing the economic crises that it frequently has. And therefore, that class has produced a philosophy that essentially says it's impossible to know what the external world is and all you are is a lone person on your island. But this, this ridiculous philosophy hangs around also because it does serve another useful purpose to somebody. It helps to spread a general cynicism and pessimism about the world. We can see that very clearly with the influence that postmodernism has had on you know, left-wing intellectuals, left-wing students who do probably do want to change this or start out wanting to change. It teaches them that the height of sophistication is to doubt everything and to see essentially that, it, you know, to, to see the world as impossible to change and to understand. And to see anybody that has practical, answers to the problems of the world as just you know very naive and simple in the same way that that uh, you know that just the ordinary person who assumes um, that they understand the world around them is, is without any theoretical knowledge is, is a rather naive person and it ends up giving these people a, a haughty kind of contempt for ordinary people and uh, and the fact that they they believe the world around them actually exists and that, and in that way it destroys their confidence in the ability of ordinary people to change society. Anyway, so, so, you know, so long as we live in a society of profound inequality, but also perhaps more importantly, of uncertainty, of the lack of control over society as a whole, so long as humanity finds itself subject to, to the fate of capitalist crisis, basically, with no control or understanding of that crisis, then this kind of skeptical mentality will continue to dominate amongst the mainstream intellectuals. So this philosophy is an expression of the bourgeois class's inability to understand its own system and inability to solve humanity's problems. And in the end, the only way that we can do away with this philosophy is ultimately, it's not through discussions like this, as important as they are for us. It is through, as Marx said, revolutionary practice. That is to say, utterly transforming the society in which we live into a society in which society as a whole and the ordinary people of society genuinely control their own fate. And when that happens, all of the skepticism, the cynicism, all of the conspiracy theories, all of that kind of mentality, that, that deeply insecure mentality will begin to, to wither away. So to solve the problem of subjective idealism, we need not so much to, to defeat it in arguments, but to defeat it in practice. And that's why it's so important that everyone on this call, everyone you know, gets involved in the fight to change society.